Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 555 John James Juju. This episode of Craftlit is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am vertical. I am very proud of that fact right now. Thank you very much. And I have a bunch of voicemails and emails for you and all sorts of goodness, plus two chapters. So, you know, it's a bargain, is what we're saying. I am also going to, in advance, apologize for my nose. We are being hit by some evil pollination activity here this week. It's been bad this week, this whole last week, because last Thursday night, I was not able to even turn on my camera. My face was so swollen and puffy, and and I'm just vain enough to care. (laughs) No, but really, nobody needed to watch my eyes ooze on camera, truly. It was not a pretty sight. That said, however, last night the wind kicked up, enough to wake me up in the middle of the night. And I'm in a basement right now, and it doesn't matter. I am still a snarfly mess, so I apologize if you can (laughs) hear it in my my nose, my voice. I'm going to try and cut out all the snarfles. That being said, hey, it's springtime, and it got up to 80 the other day. And I, I actually went outside. It was quite lovely. And then I came back inside because it was also very pollen So, <laughs> so much for that. So let's talk to some people, or at least hear from some people, who are not having horrendous allergies in their heads. First, we get to hear from Tara Worster. She brings us some information on dancing. And then a clip from Anne which the the audio was coming in kind of glitchy, but I will follow up with a comment to try and clarify. Here we go. Hello, Heather. Tara Worcester, again. You were talking at the beginning of chapter 16 and 17 about um, dancing sets, long sets, short sets, um, four corners, four square, hands in. If you want a, a quick representation of all of this, um. The Village by M. Night Shyamalan actually has a fairly good show of these sorts of dancing. Um, It's the wedding scene at about the halfway point. Yes, the wedding is interrupted by child screaming and chaos happening because of those we do not speak of. And it kind of like puts the on the happy event. But you get to see a good representation of that sort of dancing um coming together and going down the line um couple coming into the center and turning and then a lot of the line of women line of men dancing as well um another representation of those sort of dancing sets and everything is actually in downtown abbey whenever they go to highlands and they have the party where they all dance real you see and again it's it's real and it's uh scottish dancing oh i'm gonna get yelled at i can't remember it's in the highlands oh fudge it's it's scotland because a scottish man does not wear underwear under his kilt there we go (laughs) haha a proper scotsman doesn't wear underwear under his kilt uh they're in Scotland, and again, it's it's Scotland dance, Scottish dancing, but you still see the sets where the couple come together and they walk, they promenade, promenade down the lane of other dancers, uh, and you get to see a set as well where one female will jump into the center of the small circle and do a bit of dancing herself too. Uh, again, that's. Downton Abbey, it's the episode where they go to the Highlands. It's after they meet Cousin Rose. So 
the village, but in my stumble on the wedding scene, and then Downton Abbey. I hope you're having a great day, Heather. Back to the book I go. Bye. Hi, Heather. Found, discovered you and started from the beginning binging until I caught up. Something you said about Fortnite made me sort of cast back to my uh, childhood, and I never really thought about that until you were describing what Fortnite meant. All right, so Anne Blanton called in, Anne Two Step on Ravelry. Anne Blanton called in and was talking about Senite and Fortnite and how when she was growing up, it was Friday next, Saturday next. That would be a week from the following, the upcoming next day of the week that you are naming. So today is Friday. If I said Saturday next, I wouldn't mean tomorrow. I would mean a week from tomorrow, the next Saturday, blah, blah, blah. And she mentioned, I think you could probably catch it towards the end, wondering about how these phrases travel. And I am here to tell you, Ms. Ann Blanton, that you are probably exactly correct. And I can tell you how to find out for realses because you mentioned Appalachia. For those who don't live in the United States, there is a gorgeous mountain range. And I'm using the word mountain because. I have lived on the East Coast long enough to feel comfortable saying that. If you have ever looked at a topographical map of the United States or a relief map, one that's actually built out in three dimensions, you will have seen that on the western coast, you have the the Rockies that cross north and south through Colorado, notably, and all the way up and down north and south through the, the states and up into Canada. And then further west, you get the Sierra Nevada range which is largely in California, but it also goes up north and south as well. These two mountain ranges are big, tall, craggy, young mountain ranges. Denver is colloquially known as the Mile High City because of the elevation. It is way up there. The Rockies are a very tall mountain range. And I know I have said it before that my husband, who I love, has mentioned that perhaps there is something wrong with people. (laughs) When viewing the Rockies in their covered wagons, like both sides of my family did, look at the Rockies and say, let's keep going. That That's, that's probably the sign of some <laughs> character flaw. It might be. It, it likely is. But it doesn't change the fact that the mountains are gorgeous and that I am now pretty, pretty firmly in, in the belief that from... Western Colorado, all the way to the Pacific Ocean, uh, people whose families have been there for a long time are very busy people. And that perhaps this also has something to do with the, the fact that Utah is the, the beehive state, that all of the, the families, Mormon families, who with hand wagons, with wheelbarrows, walked across the vastness of this country, often from the Mississippi River all the way to Utah. Perhaps there was a little bit restless ADDism going on there too. <laughs> that and stubborn, right? It's amazing. It is just amazing. Every time I think of that, totally, I just uh, blown away. So, anyway, that's the West Coast. On the eastern side of the country, we have the Appalachian Mountain Range. And this also stretches north and south. However, it's a much older mountain range. And as a consequence, it's not as tall. It is smoother. It's not as craggy. Although, of course, there are parts of it where you still find craggy areas and and some beautiful, you know, waterfall-y kind of areas and rivulets and streams and little hidden places and ravines. I'm not saying those don't exist. I'm saying that if you look at the, the mountain range as a big sum total of mountain range, it is a softer, more worn down range. And if you look at it topographically or from a satellite like Google Earth, you will also be able to see the residue, the impact of this part of the country being raked over by glaciers. You can see both the advance and withdrawal, especially the withdrawal tracks of, of glaciers, because you can see the sediment that the glaciers left behind. It's actually quite, quite visible, which I think is just awesome. And I bring all of this up because the Appalachians 
are gorgeous. If you've been watching the Outlander series that is supposed to be taking place in the States, you have seen some amazing work done by the advanced team that does location scouting. Because my understanding is that they are still filming that whole sucker in Scotland. And that's impressive because I didn't think they'd be able to pull that off. There are definitely some shots that they have CG'd, and those are the long vista shots, because long vistas in Scotland are quite clearly Scotland. However, being up close and personal in the forest, they have managed to do a pretty darn good job of fooling non-botanists and geographers into thinking that they're they're in, um, where are they supposed to be? Carolinas? Virginia? Carolinas, Virginia, somewhere around there? Either way, they are inland far enough that they would be starting to get towards the Appalachian mountain range, if not in it. Why am I bringing all this up, all of these things together? Outlander, Anne Blanton, colloquialisms, all of these things. I am bringing them up because I know a couple of years ago, I mentioned a book I was reading pre-Scotland trip. I think it was called How the Scots Invented the Modern World. And I will put a link to this in the show notes for this episode. And yes, the, the, the website has been down. The guys who've been rebuilding it for me are working on it. I think it's working now. If it's not working now, it will be working very shortly. And at that point, it shouldn't go down again. Um, we've had some problems with the, the hosting company. It's, it's not them. Back to what I was saying about Scots. How the Scots Invented the Modern World, one of the sections is on Scots' migration patterns to the New World, to the North American part of the New World. And one of the many things that is mentioned in that book is place names and colloquialisms. And things like Schitt's Creek, spelled like or unlike the TV show. All of this stuff is actually mentioned in that book. So Anne Blanton, How the Scots Invented the Modern World, listen to that book. You should be able to get it through Hoopla or Libby through the library. It is marvelous. And it specifically talks about Appalachia and the Appalachian accents and that relationship to a Scottish accent as well. That This is one of the reasons why I think it's so much fun to listen to the book, because the guy is, who's reading it, I'm, I'm fairly certain he's Scottish, but that he's an actor and he had received pronunciation so he, he can read it like he was born in London and sounds very posh, but then he can also fall into his native Scottish marvelously well. So, yes, you are right, and yes, I think a thousand times yes, and what a lot of fun to read. I have another book recommendation for you from an email we received from Jennifer. Jennifer wrote in, and this was a while ago, so Jennifer, I totally apologize for having missed this. She said, I have come to love the books and narration of Mary Robinette Cole, spelled K-O-W-A-L. If you're not yet familiar with her, change that. I mean, Lady Astronaut of Mars? An alternate history where the space race heats up in the 50s because giant meteor strike. She reads her own stuff and also other people's stuff, and her voice reminds me of yours, and she's got a puppetry background. You sold me, as you knew you would, on Lady Astronaut of Mars? <laughs> and Jennifer goes on, So I started reading her earlier work, which is essentially Jane Austen in a World of Magic, including the main character actually being named Jane. In her third book, she describes a woman as wearing a, quote-unquote, simple round gown. I got curious. I looked up what a round gown is, and the results cited a scene from Northanger Abbey. And when I checked in with Craftlet, what do I see? The latest book is Northanger Abbey. Jennifer then said, I stopped listening to Wildfell Hall because the main character was such a nice guy. I couldn't stand him. Jennifer, go back, go back, and listen. Because depending on what chapter you stopped in, you were so close to not having to listen to him at all for like almost half the book. So go back and pick it up. You're going to love it. I can, I can tell from your email 
You're going to love it. She said, that's all. Feel free to share these contents. I'm never comfortable calling in, but do love your work. I'm so glad that you emailed. So Mary Robinette Cowell, Mary, M-A-R-Y, Robinette, R-O-B-I-N-E-T-T-E, Cowell, K-O-W-A-L. So excited to go find her books. Thank you. And here is our third voicemail, also from Tara, and a fourth voicemail from Stacy. All right, here we go. Hello, Heather. It is Tara Worcester. On this day, April 23rd, eight years ago, I put the final stitches on the border of your craftlet blanket, threw it over my head, and made happy noises that were very much akin to a parrot in its cage, knowing full well you are awake and in the same room. I was so happy knowing how much you would love this blanket and knowing good and gosh darn well how much I wanted to keep it for myself because it's just so amazing. I hope you're having a great day, Heather. I hope the blanket has brought you so much love and warmth, and I cannot wait to enjoy the new chapters of the book. Hi, Heather. This is Stacy from California, and um, I'm a little bit behind, but um, I just listened to episode 544 and um, about to hear chapter 50 of the Tenant of Wildfell Hall, and I heard you speaking about the trip to Ireland, and um, I wanted to reach out because I have a wonderful series for you to read, and it takes place in Belfast, and it takes place during the time of the Troubles, and I just I really hope that, um, you know, if you are able to read it, that you'll enjoy it as much as I have. It's um, a series of books by the author Adrian McKinty, M-C-K-I-N-T-Y, and um, they're the, the um, Sean Duffy Detective Series, and it's um, a policeman working in Belfast at the time of the Troubles, which is uh, pretty phenomenal, and um, all six I enjoyed a lot. I even named my puppy after the lead character um, after finishing the novels. And, uh, yeah, that's all I have. And I hope that you have a wonderful trip to Ireland. I've been twice, and I would love to go back. Eight years? Tara, eight years? Oh, it makes my head bend. Eight years ago, you sent me that gorgeous afghan. Yes, a thousand times yes. I love that thing. We pull it out in the wintertime because it is quite warm and it makes me so happy. And I love that as the world starts to get darker and grayer, I can pull that out and brighten everything up again. It is so beautiful and it never ever doesn't make me smile and be warm and happy and just love doing this and especially because it's allowed me to get to meet so many of you. I can't believe it's been eight years. We were in Virginia. Oh man, time flies. Wow. And Stacy, thank you for share. I know you won't hear this right away. Thank you for sharing the detective series. I have not heard of this. Adrian McKinty, the Sean Duffy detective books, six books set in Belfast. I am going to be checking those out along with Mary Robinette Cowell. So thank you for calling in with that information as well. Holy cow. What an embarrassment of riches we have received to us today. Thank you. Write the book, Northanger Abbey. You do not need me today. (laughs) You just don't. I'm going to tell you this much. We are still arranging our chess pieces on the board, which means, as is usually true, when when we aren't into an action situation, we are getting our positions in order. Usually that is indicative of chapters that focus more on characterization. And that is certainly true for this week, as I believe it was for last week as well. You will learn more about Isabella and Thorpe. 
<laughs> I got I got pinged on Facebook for continually messing up James and John. They are just both J names. So I'm sticking with Thorpe, J. Thorpe, and J. Moreland, Catherine's brother. So we are going to learn more about Isabella and her brother Thorpe, and a little bit more about Catherine's brother, J. Dot Moreland. But we're going to learn some important stuff about Catherine as well. Not as much as we do about Isabella, but but definitely uh, some interesting things that we get to see happening for our young Catherine. So easy chapters, light chapters. Here we go with chapters 18 and 19 or volume two, chapters three and four of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, read for us by Maya Digger. Here we go. Chapter 18 With a mind thus full of happiness, Catherine was hardly aware that two or three days had passed away without her seeing Isabella for more than a few minutes together. She began first to be sensible of this and to sigh for her conversation as she walked along the pump room one morning by Mrs Allen's side without anything to say or hear and scarcely had she felt a five minutes longing for friendship before the object of it appeared and inviting her to a secret conference led the way to a seat. This is my favourite place, said she, as they sat down on a bench between the doors which commanded a tolerable view of everybody entering at either. It is so out of the way. Catherine, observing that Isabella's eyes were continually bent towards one door or the other, as in eager expectation, and remembering how often she had been falsely accused of being arch, thought the present a fine opportunity for being really so. And therefore gaily said, Do not be uneasy, Isabella. James will be here soon. Pshaw, my dear creature, she replied, Do not think me such a simpleton as to be always wanting to confine him to my elbow. It would be hideous to be always together. We should be the jest of the place. And so you're going to Northanger. I'm amazingly glad of it. It is one of the finest old places in England, I understand. I shall depend upon a most particular description of it. You shall certainly have the best in my power to give. But who are you looking for? Are your sisters coming? I'm not looking for anybody. One's eye must be somewhere, and you know what a foolish trick I have of fixing mine when my thoughts are a hundred miles off. I'm amazingly absent. I believe I'm the most absent creature in the world. Tilney says it's always the case with minds of a certain stamp. But I thought, Isabella, you had something in particular to tell me. Oh, yes, and so I have. But here is proof of what I was saying. My poor head, I quite forgot it. Well, the thing is, I've just had a letter from John. You can guess the contents. No, indeed, I cannot. My sweet love, do not be so abominably affected. What can he write about but yourself? You know he is over head and ears in love with you. With me, dear Isabella. Nay, my sweet Catherine, this has been quite absurd. Modesty and all that is very well in its way, but really a little common honesty is sometimes quite as becoming. I've no idea of being so overstrained. It's fishing for compliments. His attentions were such as a child might have noticed, and it was but half an hour before he left Bath that you gave him the most positive encouragement. He says so in this letter. He says that he is good and made you an offer, and that you received his advances in the kindest way, and now he wants me to urge his suit and say all manner of pretty things to you, so it is in vain to affect ignorance. Catherine, with all the earnestness of truth, expressed her astonishment at such a charge, protesting her innocence of every thought of Mr Thorpe's being in love with her, and the consequent impossibility of her having ever intended to encourage him. As to any attentions on his side, I do declare upon my honour I was never sensible of them for a moment, except just his asking me to dance the first day of his coming, and as to him making me an offer or anything like that, there must be some unaccountable mistake. I could not have misunderstood a thing of that kind, you know, and as I ever wished to be believed, I solemnly protest that no syllable of such a nature ever passed between us. The last half hour before he went away? It must be all and completely a mistake, for I did not see him once that whole morning. But that you certainly did, for you spent the whole morning in Edgar's buildings. It was the day your father's consent came, and I'm pretty sure that you and John were alone in the parlour some time before you left the house. Are you? Well, if you say it was so, I dare say, but for the life of me I cannot recollect it. I do remember now being with you and seeing him as well as the rest, but, but that we were alone for five minutes. 
However, it's not worth arguing about, for whatever may pass on his side, you must be convinced at my having no recollection of it, that I never thought, nor expected, nor wished for anything of the kind from him. I'm excessively concerned that he should have any regard for me. But indeed, it's been quite unintentional on my side. I never had the smallest idea of it. Please undeceive him as soon as you can, and tell him I beg his pardon. That is, I do not know what I ought to say, but make him understand what I mean in the properest way. I would not speak disrespectfully of a brother of yours, Isabella, I'm sure, but you know very well that if I could think of one man more than another, he is not the person. Isabella was silent. My dear friend, you must not be angry with me. I cannot suppose your brother cares so very much about me, and you know, we shall still be sisters. Yes, yes, with a blush. There are more ways than one of our being sisters, but where am I wandering to? Well, my dear Catherine, the case seems to be that you are determined against poor John. Is it not so? I certainly cannot return his affection, and I certainly never meant to encourage it. Since that is the case, I'm sure I shall not tease you any further. John desired me to speak to you on the subject, and therefore I have. But I confess, as soon as I read his letter, I thought it very foolish, imprudent business, and not likely to promote the good of either. For what were you to live on, supposing you came together? You have both of you something, to be sure, but it's not a trifle that would support a family nowadays. After all that romancers may say, there is no doing without money. I only wonder John could think of it. He could have not received my last. You do acquit me, then, of doing anything wrong? You are convinced, then, that I never meant to deceive your brother, never suspected him of liking me till this moment. Oh, as to that, answered Isabella, laughingly, I do not pretend to determine what your thoughts and designs in times past may have been. All that is best known to yourself. A little harmless flirtation or so will occur, and one's often drawn on to give more encouragement than one wishes to stand by. But you may be assured that I am the last person in the world to judge you severely. All those things should be allowed for in youth and high spirits. What one means one day, you know, one may not mean the next. Circumstances may change. Opinions alter. But my opinion of your brother never did alter. It was always the same. You're describing what never happened. My dearest Catherine, continued the other without at all listening to her, I would not for all the world be the means of hurrying you into an engagement before you knew what you were about. I do not think anyone would justify me in wishing you to sacrifice all your happiness merely to oblige my brother, because he is my brother, and who perhaps, after all, you know, might be just as happy without you, for people seldom know what they would be at, young men especially. They're so amazingly changeable and inconsistent. What I say is, why should a brother's happiness be dearer to me than a friend's? You know I carry my notions of friendship pretty high, but above all things, my dear Catherine, do not be in a hurry. Take my word for it, that if you are in too great a hurry, you will certainly live to repent it. Tilney says there's nothing people are so often deceived in as the state of their own affections, and I believe he's very right. Ah, oh, here he comes. Never mind, he will not see us, I'm sure. Catherine, looking up, perceived Captain Tilney, and Isabella, earnestly fixing her eye on him as she spoke, soon caught his notice. He approached immediately and took the seat to which her movements invited him. His first address made Catherine start, though spoken low she could distinguish. What? Always to be watched in person or by proxy? Psh, nonsense, was Isabella's answer in the same half-whisper. Why do you put such things into my head? If I could believe it, my spirit, you know, is pretty independent. I wish your heart were independent. That would be enough for me. My heart, indeed. What can you have to do with hearts? You men have none of you any hearts. If we have not hearts, we have eyes, and they give us torment enough. Do they? I'm sorry for it. I am sorry if they find anything disagreeable in me. I will look another way. I hope this pleases you. Turning her back on him, I hope your eyes are not tormented now. Never more so, for the edge of a blooming cheek is still in view. At once too much and too little. Catherine heard all this, and, quite out of countenance, could listen no longer. Amazed that Isabella could endure it, and jealous for her brother, she rose up, and, saying she should join Mrs. Allen, proposed their walking. But for this Isabella showed no inclination. She was so amazingly tired, and it was so tedious to parade about the pump-room, and if she moved from her seat, she should miss her sisters. 
She was expecting her sisters every moment, so that her dearest Catherine must excuse her and must sit quietly down again. But Catherine could be stubborn too, and Mrs. Allen, just then coming up to propose their returning home, she joined her and walked out of the pump room, leaving Isabella still sitting with Captain Tilney. With much uneasiness did she thus leave them. It seemed to her that Captain Tilney was falling in love with Isabella, and Isabella unconsciously encouraging him. Unconsciously it must be, for Isabella's attachment to James was as certain and well acknowledged as her engagement. To doubt her truth or good intentions was impossible, and yet, during the whole of their conversation, her manner had been odd. She wished Isabella had talked more like her usual self, and not so much about money, and had not looked so well pleased at the sight of Captain Tilney. How strange that she should not perceive his admiration! Catherine longed to give her a hint of it, to put her on her guard, and prevent all the pain to which her too lively behaviour might otherwise create for both him and her brother. The compliment of John Thorpe's affection did not make amends for this thoughtlessness in his sister. She was almost as far from believing as from wishing it to be sincere, for she had not forgotten that he could mistake, and his assertion of the offer, and of her encouragement, convinced her that his mistakes could sometimes be very egregious. In vanity, therefore, she gained but little. Her chief profit was in wonder. That he should think it worth his while to fancy himself in love with her was a matter of lively astonishment. Isabella talked of his attentions. She had never been sensible of any, but Isabella had said many things which she hoped had been spoken in haste, and would never be said again. And upon this she was glad to rest altogether for present ease and comfort. CHAPTER Nineteen. A few days passed away, and Catherine, though not allowing herself to suspect her friend, could not help watching her closely. The result of her observations were not agreeable. Isabella seemed an altered creature. When she saw her, indeed surrounded only by their immediate friends, in Edgar's buildings or Pulteney Street, her change of manners was so trifling that, had it gone no farther, it might have passed unnoticed. A something of languid indifference, or of that boasted absence of mind which Catherine had never heard of before, would occasionally come across her. But had nothing worse appeared, that might only have spread new grace and inspired a warmer interest. But when Catherine saw her in public, admitting Captain Tilney's attentions as readily as they were offered, and allowing him almost an equal share with James in her notice and smiles, the alteration became too positive to be passed over. What could be meant by such unsteady conduct? What her friend could be at was beyond her comprehension. Isabella could not be aware of the pain she was inflicting, but it was a degree of willful thoughtlessness which Catherine could not but resent. James was the sufferer. She saw him, grave and uneasy, and however careless of his present comfort the woman might be who had given him her heart, to her it was always an object. For poor Captain Tilney, too, she was greatly concerned. Though his looks did not please her, his name was a passport to her goodwill, and she thought with sincere compassion of his approaching disappointment. For in spite of what she had believed herself to overhear in the pump-room, his behaviour was so incompatible with the knowledge of Isabella's engagement that she could not, upon reflection, imagine him aware of it. He might be jealous of her brother as a rival, but if more had seemed implied, the fault must have been in her misapprehension. She wished, by a gentle remonstrance, to remind Isabella of her situation and make her aware of this double unkindness. But for remonstrance, either the opportunity or comprehension was always against her. If able to suggest a hint, Isabella could never understand it. In this distress, the intended departure of the Tilney family became her chief consolation. Their journey into Gloucestershire was to take place within a few days, and Captain Tilney's removal would at least restore peace to every heart but his own. But Captain Tilney had at present no intention of removing. He was not to be of the party to Northanger. He was to continue at Bath. When Catherine knew this, her resolution was directly made. She spoke to Henry Tilney on the subject, regretting his brother's evident partiality for Miss Thorpe, and entreating him to make known her prior engagement. "'My brother does know it,' was Henry's answer. "'Does he? Then why does he stay here?' He made no reply, and was beginning to talk of something else, but she eagerly continued. "'Why did you not persuade him to go away? 
The longer he stays, the worse it will be for him at last. Pray advise him for his own sake and for everybody's else to leave Bath directly. Absence will in time make him comfortable again, but he can have no hope here, and it is only staying to be miserable. Henry smiled and said, I am sure my brother would not wish to do that. Then will you persuade him to go away? Persuasion is not at command, but pardon me if I cannot even endeavour to persuade him. I have myself told him that Miss Thorpe is engaged. He knows what he's about and must be his own master. No, he does not know what he is about, cried Catherine. He does not know the pain he has given my brother. Not that James has ever told me so, but I'm sure he's very uncomfortable. And are you sure it's my brother's doing? Yes, I'm very sure. Is it my brother's attentions to Miss Thorpe, or Miss Thorpe's admission of them, that gives the pain? Is it not the same thing? I think Mr. Morland would acknowledge the difference. No man is offended by another man's admiration of the woman he loves. It is the woman only who can make it a torment. Catherine blushed for her friend and said, Isabella is wrong, but I'm sure she cannot mean to torment, for she's very much detached to my brother. She's been in love with him ever since they first met, and while my father's consent was uncertain, she fretted herself almost into a fever. You know she must be attached to him. I understand. She's in love with James and flirts with Frederick. Oh, no, not flirts. A woman in love with one man cannot flirt with another. It is probable that she will neither love so well nor flirt so well as she might do either singly. The gentlemen must each give up a little. After a short pause, Catherine resumed with, Then you do not believe Isabella so very much attached to my brother? I can have no opinion on that subject. But what can your brother mean? If he knows her engagement, what can he mean by his behaviour? You are a very close questioner. Am I? I only ask what I want to be told. But do you only ask what I can be expected to tell? Yes, I think so. For you must know your brother's heart. My brother's heart, as you term it, on the present occasion I assure you I can only guess at. Well? Well? Nay, if it is to be guesswork, let us all guess for ourselves. To be guided by a second-hand conjecture is pitiful. The premises are before you. My brother is a lively and perhaps sometimes a thoughtless young man. He has had about a week's acquaintance with your friend and he has known her engagement almost as long as he's known her. Well, said Catherine after some moments' consideration, you may be able to guess at your brother's intentions from all this, but I'm sure I cannot. But is not your father uncomfortable about it? Does not he want Captain Tilney to go away? Sure, if your father were to speak to him, he would go. My dear Miss Morland, said Henry, in this amiable solicitude for your brother's comfort, may you not be a little mistaken? Are you not carried a little too far? Would he thank you, either on his own account or Miss Thorpe's, for supposing that her affection, or at least her good behaviour, is only to be secured by her seeing nothing of Captain Tilney? Is he safe only in solitude? Or is her heart constant to him only when unsolicited by anyone else? He cannot think this, and you may be sure he would not have you think it. I will not say do not be uneasy, because I know that you are so at this moment. But be as little uneasy as you can. You have no doubt of the mutual attachment of your brother and your friend. Depend upon it, therefore, that real jealousy can never exist between them. Depend upon it that no disagreement between them can be of any duration. Their hearts are open to each other, as neither heart can be to you. They know exactly what is required and what can be borne, and you can be certain that one will never tease the other beyond what is known to be pleasant. Perceiving her still to look doubtful and grave, he added, Though Frederick does not leave Bath with us, he will probably remain but a very short time, perhaps only a few days behind us. His leave of absence will soon expire and he must return to his regiment. And what then will be their acquaintance? The mess room will drink Isabella Thorpe for a fortnight and she will laugh with your brother over poor Tilney's passion for a month. Catherine would contend no longer against comfort. She had resisted its approaches during the whole length of the speech, but it now carried her captive. Henry Tilney must know best. She blamed herself for the extent of her fears and resolved never to think so seriously on the subject again. Her resolution was supported by Isabella's behaviour in their parting interview. 
The Thorpes spent the last evening of Catherine's stay in Pulteney Street, and nothing passed between the lovers to excite her uneasiness or to make her quit them in apprehension. James was in excellent spirits, and Isabella most engagingly placid. Her tenderness for her friend seemed rather the first feeling of her heart, but that at such a moment was allowable, and once she gave her lover a flat contradiction, and once she drew back her hand. But Catherine remembered Henry's instructions, and placed it all to judicious affection. The embraces, tears and promises of the parting fair ones may be fancied. Yeah, so, Catherine defended herself, which made me very happy, in, in standing up for the fact that she was not proposed to, and she was not. Thorpe was definitely kind of hedging around the conversation topic, but he certainly never flat out said, hey, babe, let's get hitched. That said, ew, the other thing that you probably picked up on is Isabella was talking about Tilney. Now, Tilney for her is Captain Tilney, not General, not Daddy Tilney. Captain Tilney, older brother to Henry Tilney. And that's troublesome because that's a level of familiarity between Isabella and Captain Tilney that should make us all just a wee bit uncomfortable. It's certainly starting to make Catherine uncomfortable. And her reactions are the most full of spine, I think, that we've seen from Catherine to date. Which is lovely because I certainly wanted her to respond like that. Definitely. I also appreciated the fact that it appeared in the text that Catherine speaking to Henry Tilney was without any kind of romantic fanfare. There was no, she had to maneuver herself into a dance set with Henry to be able to find a way to discuss this delicate thing with him. No, it was, she was upset. So she spoke to Henry Tilney on the subject. Boom. And that's it. And then I loved Henry's response to her. You know, he, he listens, he takes her seriously. He's not making fun of her at all. And she's shocked to find out that Captain Tilney does know that Isabella is connected to her brother. Henry Tilney says, I have myself told him that Miss Thorpe is engaged. He knows what he's about and must be his own master. And she says, he doesn't know what he's about. He doesn't know the pain he's giving my brother. Not that James has ever told me so, but I'm quite sure that he's uncomfortable, which I just love. It's so sweet of her. And he said, are you very sure it's my brother's doing? Yes, very sure. Is it my brother's attentions to Miss Thorpe or Miss Thorpe's admission of them that gives the pain? Her response, is it not the same thing, is so innocent. Henry Tilney's response, I think Mr. Moreland, your brother, would acknowledge a difference, is really important. And it goes back to something that I know we've talked about before on the podcast, especially when we've had romances, that women will attack other women for going after my guy or stealing my guy, but they won't acknowledge the fact that perhaps Part of the problem is that your guy was so easily swayed by another female. It has less to do with her flirtations and a lot more to do with his inconstancy. Here it's flipped. Perhaps the problem isn't that Captain Tilney is being an audacious flirt, my goodness, but that Isabella is allowing it. And that's an important lesson, not just for Catherine, but for all young women, I would posit. Yet another book. Here we are. Yet another book that would be good for young women to read. I wish I had read this book when I was younger myself. For one thing, it's just a lot of fun. So I hope you are continuing to enjoy Northanger with me. I hope you are continuing to enjoy the awesome Maya Daguerre and sending some love from you to her in a way of thanks. All those links are in the show notes. And if, again, the actual 
craftlit.com website is still down. You can always find Craftlit at craftlit.libsyn.com. For reasons which are unclear to me at this time, Libsyn is not able to post directly to Facebook. I am working on that. I do not know what's going on, but, but we're working on all that. Thank you so much for your support, for being awesome, for writing in, for calling in. If you want to call in, please do at area code 206-350-1642. Or you can write at heather at craftlet.com. And I'll talk to you later. Be well. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Get vaccinated. Wear a mask. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.